So you sitting here at Shush Lounge. Last 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 time you were in this room was to DJ my birthday party. Yep, that was dope. And uh, Nori, CeeLo, and a bunch of other people. Yeah. But that was the second birthday party of mine you spun. Yeah. And I've done one for you so far. Yes. So you kind of got to keep me. keep that shit going. Yeah, you owe me. I do owe. Yeah, I do owe you. I do owe you. Uh, your birthday's in March, right? Yep. Yep. So March 30th, 2020. That's right. All right. Cool. Cool. But um. Oh, cool. Yeah. I started thinking about about the time when I met you, like, cause I have like a a, a a mind like an elephant, a memory like an elephant. So I remember the exact day we met. When? 2003. Okay. Electric Lady Studio. Mm -hmm. You were doing a session for Sarah Divine, I believe. Yeah. I think you were mixing. Okay. And you had on a huge throwback jersey. Yeah, it was like 2003. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah, it was uh, like a Mitchell and Nessel, you know, whatever, whatever those were back then. And, uh, whatever official thing it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I remember um, you walked in downstairs and I was sitting on the couch. And then uh, I think it was either Guy was with you or Selwyn was with you. And, uh, and they were like, oh, that's, uh, that's, that's KP. I was like, oh, who's KP? He's like, oh, now nah, he works at Sony, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And you know me, young me, young rapper me, like, oh, shit. Yeah. Rap time. Yeah, it's rap time. <laughs> but um, what was your life like? Like, where were you at in life at that point uh, in 2003, that summer? Obviously influenced by Dipset. Um, <laughs> um, living in New York. Um, Atlanta dude in New York, like just figuring out how to how to navigate and, and realizing it was the same rules, the same principles were working that helped got me through the, the process through from DJing to doing A and R to producing, you know, like from all those things, the same rules applied. And it was just about, you know, be for me it was be honest, be clear, you know, pay attention, you know, what you see is what it is and deal with it as such in the moment. And, the, you know, I was probably at the, at the place where I felt the most comfortable in my skin. Okay. Yeah. What you mean? Like, like, around that time, I was just in, I was really comfortable in my skin. I was really, like, clear about um, what I enjoyed, what I didn't enjoy. And about the music business, about, about music, about, you know, just things going on in my world. What, what didn't you enjoy about me, the music? The business and just music in general, what didn't you like? Um, at that time, yeah. um, I realized that the the bigger you got, the the more um, the more the influences that that happen in the process, like because there were more people involved, more. It, I guess it was more at risk. I guess because it was more money, more you know, yeah. You got people who working for you. It's like, uh, and I would see artists go through this thing where. You know, they would, in their purest form, their real thought, dope. But then when they get to this place where they know so much, they start tailoring and filtering based on, not necessarily their real thought, but like, you know, I mean, the, the, the beauty of the growth is you get experiences and you get new perspective, right? But it's that thing where other people's perspective starts playing into how artists edit themselves when they're really dope right you saw you saw that happening yeah i was seeing that just from a from a you know just from a big space because i was on a bigger i was in a bigger company i was at sony yeah before all of that because i want to take it back to your beginning um because you were born and raised in atlanta yep when i was going to uh, fam you i came across a cd that had the letters p a on it mm -hmm. And underneath it, it said parental advisory. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that five years later, I would be meeting the DJ from that group. But talk to me about parental advisory. How did that group form? Like, cause you were, you were the DJ of the group, right? Yeah. It was a three man group. Yep. How did you even get into the, the, the desire to want to DJ? Um, okay. Oh, oh, that's easy actually. Um, I started, the first time I ever heard like, scratching right was on this record rocket uh herbie hancock like my homeboy who lived in these apartments i lived in in college park uh, courtney parham he played me this record and i was like i just didn't understand what was happening and he was like yeah that's that's scratching that's like you know and he would yeah exactly like ooh. and um so we went to this this record store across the street third world and 
and bought that record. And then I came home and started like fucking it up, like trying to scratch. Comes <laughs> so about the first time I did it, I did it with the the needle head, like just <laughs> right, yeah, because nobody, it was nobody else. Was I just heard it. I hadn't seen a video, nothing, right? So I thought that was cool, and I was like, okay, that sounds like it can be done. I just got to figure it out. All right, um, fast forward. Um, I run into me and me and my cousin. We used to do these like little um, runs, these airport runs, where you can go, you know, the little luggage rack things. So we would go get those from the parking lot, bring them back to the to the little slot thing, get twenty five cent, like, and just rack up and go to the arcade that was in the in the airport. So one of those days, I was in there playing video games, and this dude walks up, you know, like a little nameplate of Kango, and I'm playing this kung fu game. And, you know, I'm playing, I look over, he jumps in, like, yo, shorty, you mind if I play? I'm like, cool, whatever. Um, but I see this chain, I'm like, damn, that shit tight. Um, and, you know, in my, like, probably 10, 11 year old thought, like, that's really nice. Um, but come to find out, it's LL Cool J. Oh, shit. Right, right. So, so I'm like, wow. But I had this little Walkman, this little Radio Shack Walkman. And um, after we finished playing the game, he was like, yo, yo, shorty, would you, would you sell that, that, your, your headphones to me. I was like, you know, like, I was like, what you, and, but then he was like, no, no, whatever, like, how much would you sell it for? And I was like, Radio Shack, might have been 15, 20 bucks. I was like, 40. And he was like, all right, cool. And I was like, oh shit, that was tight. And um, then, you know, we started talking. He, I'm like, so what do you do? And he tells me, like, I rap, I was here doing a show. You ever heard this on radio? And I'm like, oh shit, yeah. Damn. And he's like, yeah, so I'm here with, you know, the Beastie Boys and some other people. He's like, you want to meet them? And, you know, I'm like, you know, and this is pre, like, TSA, you can't go past certain spaces in the airport. We just went back to the concourse, me and my cousin. We met, like, the Beastie Boys and Hurricane and, and um, Cut Creator. And I had a conversation with Cut Creator. And he, he said a bunch of cool shit about what his part was in all of it. And I was like, wow, that's, that, that sounds crazy. I feel like I could do that for real. I was still like, I was in it. Um, and then that Christmas, my mom bought me turntables. Some like realistic belt drive turntables from like Radio Shack with the little realistic mixer. And I went ham. I was like 13 by the end. How long did it take before you felt like you got good? When you were like, okay, like this is not, not, this is not only a new infatuation, but I'm actually skillful or talented with this um it's unfair because i like my self-esteem is different um <laughs> like i even when i wasn't right i understood it enough to know where i was gonna go with it to feel like okay you might not see, like nobody's gonna see this right now it's just gonna take me this time like i knew i had enough um i felt like i had enough taste to 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 understand how to get from point A to point B cool in a cool way, musically. Right. Like, you know, it was what I did at the house with my family. It was, you know, that kind of, yo, come on, play, play some music. So it was like, it was a thing. Um, so it didn't make, it didn't, it didn't strike me as odd. I just needed to know how to do it. And plus at that time I was playing football, like eighth grade football. And I realized I was like, I don't, want to run into nobody this fast every day <laughs> like you know what i'm saying and and you know like what's the the payoff for me and i'm like i don't get i don't have that feeling for it so let me not let me find something i, I care about and yeah and dj so because you know it, it makes me think about the way i i started and um because i started so late in life i started djing at 28 but a lot of people I caught a lot of flack for it in different ways. And a lot of people seem to think that because I started so late that my music knowledge started at that time. And it's like, no, you know, if you knew the history and where I come from and my family and all that shit, it was just about learning how to operate the, mech, the, the machinery. Right. But I never owned any turntables. So all my, my practice came live, like in the moment in front of people. And that's why like the first year or so I was like really bad at this shit because I was like figuring it out in the, in the room of 500 people, you know, I didn't have the opportunity to like be in my room and practice eight hours a day and oh, no, that's, then that's go, lucky then go and horrible. It's right. It's a yeah, catch it's 22, like, right? Yeah, it's like it's 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 lucky and it's you know a blessing to have the platform to like because there's no other there's no better way to learn than in that moment because all the shit you practice in your room 
it sounds good to you, but get in a room with five people who aren't, who've never been to the to your city before, you know, or, or 20 people, a group of 20 that came in from out of town, and they don't know the local stuff, but, but they want to. Like, you gotta figure out how to, you gotta have enough knowledge of other music to get them involved with them, the rest of the people, so everybody feels good about it, so just don't turn into another thing. Right. You know, it's, it's the knowledge of music that gets you through it more than anything, like, I think. Like, because whenever I see DJs get stuck, it's like, yeah, it's hard when you don't have, a, have like another, all you got is swag surf. Yeah, you got to go somewhere else. Like, now where you going to go? Now what? Like, we all got swag, swag surf. <laughs> yeah, I, I played it <laughs> two days ago. Listen, man, it's the best song ever. Like, like I hope, I wish there was an award for, like, most dependable, like, undefeated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so when you started, so you like you 13, 14, eighth grade, you like, all right, fuck this football shit, I'm gonna get into get into DJing. Mm -hmm. But then how did the group uh parental advisory form? Okay, so that happened because I was DJing uh like a high school talent show out at, at my school and um this dude Troy, who was the brother of my homeboy Corey, who passed, rest in peace, um, um, he was in a group with his homeboy Mello. And Mello ended up being Mello in the group that I was in, PA. Me and Mello got cool through Corey. You know, Corey took a different route. You know, we stayed doing music. It was, um, you know, it was one of those kind of things where we did that. We ended up meeting Ray and, well, I've, I've known Ray Murray from Organized Noise. He's like one third of the, the, the production company, Organized Noise. Me and him grew up together. So, um, and I kind of grew up, like I floated around Atlanta, like I had family everywhere. So like summers I'd be in one part of the city, you know, on the weekends I might be in a whole nother part. I lived in this part, like it was, like I, I kind of always was in the mix by mistake or by, what is it, um, circumstance. But in that I got comfortable being in different spaces. Um, but I also met a bunch of cool people like so, when I'm in College Park for the summer, it's in these apartments called Brandon Town, where my cousin Mark lived, but also Jermaine Dupree and a bunch of other people. So at the swimming pool, we all just got cool. You know, it's like in everywhere, like everywhere I went, I, I would get these relationships. But with Ray Murray, he was like older than me in the neighborhood where I grew up. But he was into graffiti and hip hop. He was like for real hip hop. Like as hip hop as I, you know, somebody from Atlanta was or whatever so uh, anyway he I got up with him and we all met up with Rico um, Pat was down with Rico we all like met um, Ray knew this guy Reese who ended up being in our group PA so it was me Reese and Mello and all of us kind of came together based on pooling together equipment and ideas did Ray do the beats Ray 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 was the first Ray sleepy Rico me, um, Melo, like we all learned how to produce. Like everybody, like by the way, like everybody in the Dungeon family on some level can actually really produce. It's like, like Outkast produced Elevators. Like, you know, me, Reese and Melo produced 85 for Youngblood. What? Yeah. I didn't know that damn. Yeah, yeah. It's my favorite Youngblood record. Oh, cool, tight. Um, <laughs> but it's like everybody like learned because we were just figuring shit out. So, you know, okay, so fast forward, um, we end up, because the same guy, Troy, who, who hooked me up with Melo, he was dating Tion, who is t Boss from TLC. She became cool with all of us. So during the time we were getting our stuff together, they get signed. Organized Noise? Organized Noise, no, 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 t um, TLC. Oh, T okay. Okay, so TLC gets signed, they then bring or well, Tion called us and was like, yo, we're doing auditions for this video. Pebbles is going to be here. Why don't y'all come down and audition for her? And this was the, the audition for Baby, Baby, Baby. So I put all my you know, equipment in the trunk. You know, we went down and instead of, so I was like, yo, where we bring, where do we bring the equipment? And Tion told us where to go. We set up and, and Pebbles was like, what y'all doing? And um, we're like, oh, we want to audition. She's like, well, this is a video audition. I'm like, but she told us to come, <laughs> and, and and she was like, well, um, she was like, well, listen, you got you, 
are you interested in being in a video? I'm like, and she was like, no, 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 okay, hear me this way. You want my time to see y'all, you, you can be in the video. You'll be Chili's boyfriend. Yeah. And I was like, all right, cool. If that gets us the audition, cool. Yeah. You know, and, and it did, and she liked us, she signed us. We got signed to, back then it was signed to La Face. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so anyway, so, and I ended up in the Baby 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 video. I gotta go back and see that video. You Chili's boyfriend in the video? Yeah, it's hilarious. I gotta go see that. It's quite funny. Yeah, cross colors. Um, <laughs> it was tight. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, so we, we we got signed to Pebbles. We ended up eventually coming out on MCA with her label, Savvy. Mm. But, you know, she moved us from La Face to her thing, which, you know, was cool. We didn't, whatever, right? Um, but during that time, we, I learned, personally, I learned a lot watching her. Like, watching and how she this. developed you know, artists, like I would just, I saw her do stuff that I didn't understand. Like, um, like the baby, baby, baby video, we were just, she signed us from that. So that meant she had to go to editing and stuff from the video, right? right. But she, while we were getting signed, she was like, you gonna come meet me at the editing spot? And she be in there like for real editing, writing names on the screen. Like if you saw TLC and these little drawings, she actually be doing it and um i was like wow that's cool like but she was just like really clear about her vision and you know like and understanding who the girls were like at the time like what they were what they were about so she was you know she was kind of like in it and i was like oh wow that's cool and the more i saw her work the more i was interested in this side side yeah because i was like oh somebody who understands the language of the artist but and cares about the outcome on the other side, but can speak to the the business side as well and understand how certain like nuance matters. And it's like you notice like the details of things on certain artists are you notice them different than artists who might have a good song sometimes and you just like, I don't know who this person is. It's cause nobody was in there kinda making sure the 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 the, the what do you call it? the line was being told throughout, like to make sure that you kept the identity through it. Like even when you do different directors, even when you do different producers, right. it's like somebody that remind everybody what the, the common denominator is. Right. So she helped me understand that, like keep the thread, if you can, if, if it is that. Right. So within that, like, so where did the, I guess the, the deconstruction of the group happen? You know, because um, you were, as you signed, you put a record out. You know, we were touring, we, we were, and again, we were the first group out of the Dungeon family to get a deal. So we were kind of like learning. To See, I don't, and I don't think that's something that gets mentioned enough. You know what I'm saying? Like that's. Who would say it? We, like it didn't work as big. So it's like, but I'm saying that. But that's same. like, wouldn't that be like, like when they say, well, LL was the first artist on Def Jam, but then you forget about. Um, Tila Rock. Tila Rock. Yeah, so you can't, you can't tell the LL story without at least mentioning it. LL had to tell it though. True. Like for it to have validity, like, True. yeah, for it to have Kate, uh, with a credence, mm-hmm. somebody, like Rick Rubin got to say it. Right, right, right. So, I mean, and they, and they did, whatever, it's one of them documentaries. But I say all that to say, the, the most famous person's story is the truest. Mm-hmm. So it's like, and, and by the way, it's not, it doesn't make anybody else's a lie or theirs a lie, it's just right. their portion. Gotcha. It's like, if you watch documentaries on certain periods and they talk about the biggest people not always that one record that came out that might have started that they don't they don't talk about the, the they don't talk about it's yours as much as they talk about rock the bells it was bigger on an artist that was bigger so and at that point when you know you you did was it like a conscious decision to be like all right well the artist group side of things isn't working the way maybe we nah. wanted to or no nah, what happened was um while we, were, we would be out and i was djing or we'd be on tour i'd meet people and because we knew la and pebbles i'd be like yo you know q-tip do you know la um so and so do you you know like i'd be like yo i know these people and i just kind of connect and um and one day both la and pebbles had said it before like you should really consider being on this side because you're doing a whole job sometimes and i'm like well, well whatever you know i like being a dj i like you know i like what i was doing and um but we were being in the studio and 
you know, in the Dungeon Family, it's a lot of us. Yeah. And somehow I would always, be, well, at the time, you know, like I didn't smoke, I didn't drink. I was the probably the only person at the time that didn't smoke or drink. So I kind of, by default, would be the responsible one. Right. Not like by, you know, choice. choice. Not even by even like, yo, KP, will you? It's just like, all right, let me, hey, <laughs> yo. The, and then LA and Pebbles would then, they were seeing that like, yo, you know you're doing like a whole job. Like that's yeah. like, and, and Pebbles explained to me, A&R, blah, blah, blah. A couple years later after touring, she said, you, you know, you're still doing this job. Why don't you consider it? LA really wants to talk to you about it. And I did. And so I was still in a group, but then I started doing A&R. And the A&R shit started working. Like, I think I did, like, Usher, My Way. I was, a, you know, AT Aliens. I was credited for, like, because I didn't, like, in the first Outkast album, everybody was just a contributor, like, our whole crew. Right. So I, I guess I learned A&R there. Because oh, I, no, I don't want to cut you off, but because no. the, the term A&R means artist and repertoire, right? Right. But what does, like, if, if you had to define it, not, maybe not necessarily now, but back then, the job of an A&R was to do what or is to do what exactly? The way I was explained is the person to, to help communicate the creative ideas properly between all the creatives so that the, you know, it gets finished and gets done. It's almost like a, a musical product manager or uh, like air traffic control or like the dude in you know on in the box somebody who can see what's going on and be like yo I know what you're trying to get done but because you're not seeing that you, you're not listening to him say that you know it, it was just I, I helped communicate right and, and I think that's what when it's done properly it's like somebody with taste who can who who knows the language mm -hmm. who can communicate through you know all the parties involved it's right. like that's what that's what I did doing A&R you know. So sorry, so go back. So it, my way, AT aliens. Uh, and so we're in the group. Our group isn't as big as the stuff that I'm doing as A and R, but now we're signed to DreamWorks, and DreamWorks is kind of they 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 talk to me because they they feel like I know because they know I do this A and R shit yeah. over at at um, La Face. Um, they they wanted to talk to me more, and it started getting kind of getting confusing about like making me like this like spokesperson or leader in the group but that had never been a conversation in our group and we had management but the, all that being said one day we have a conversation and it it was said that that was getting in the way so i was like listen we're all friends like i'd rather be friends than be dealing with this shit or being in in friction boom i'm like i'll just i guess i'll just do this and you know that way y'all can and i don't mess it up and yeah that was it and that became like your foray into just straight executive yeah. side and, and the business side of it. Yeah. Like, I, what's funny is I think I stopped DJing around that time. That time? Mm -hmm. Like consciously or you just like you just started doing it less and less? Because were you doing, was it only like touring stuff or were you doing like parties and clubs and shit? Just touring. I was in a group, so I was touring mostly. Yeah. So it wasn't like I came home to like gigs. So right. it was like, you know, I was touring we were, and, and I was producing. Like we were like for lack of a better term, back in that space, it was like naughty by nature -ish. And it, like, you know, I was like the KG. Like and, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's what I wanted to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, so, um, yeah, and yeah, so it just, it, I was for, not forced, but I fell into it. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> me being the person I am, I wanted to learn it really well. So I stopped doing everything and just focused on like listening to LA and paying attention to the artists and like just trying to figure out the commonalities and like yeah I looked at it like like DJ and me was like okay how does this go together like how do how does how does this make sense and that was always my you know focus. you have a you have a favorite record out of the the Dungeon family pr creative history or repertoire like something that sticks out the most Maybe it's not the best song. Maybe it's not the best Goody Mob song or the best, but you know, one that maybe means more to you than what might be considered the hit or the. You know? No, I get you. I, I'm, I'm like, it's, but that's the thing. It's like a couple of those. Um, man. Okay, it might. It's, it's Return of the Gangster. From um, and I. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just love everything about that one. It, it, it I felt like it was a record that happened when all of us was 
were really growing up and figuring out who we were. So it's like people were starting to figure out their own little things about themselves. And Dre's verse kind of set it up. Like, Monster. like you know, it's just, I think I'm feeling better than you. <laughs> you get down. Like, yeah. I'm feeling better than ever. Oh, man. <laughs> and it was like, it was, a, it, it was a moment. I think that was, for me, that song. And, you know, and, and you know, Big. I just want to sit back, watch my little girl blow bubbles. It's oh, like, yeah, like, come on, bro. Like, what's what's cooler than that? Right. Like, what's that success? Right. At that point, there, because they had already, because that album was a classic. I think Source gave it five mics. I love more, but yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. One time, seven. So I'm big up. Um, so you're in there, you're A and R LaFace Records, you're doing the music side of things, Outcast blown up, Goody Mars blown up, everything, Young Bloods, everybody, Dungeon Family's expanding. Somewhere within that comes the creation, the formation of Ghetto Vision. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Um, so same time all this DreamWorks stuff is like I'm I'm in a group at DreamWorks, but I'm being successful at A and R. The people at DreamWorks asked me, you know, what would it take for me to come work at DreamWorks? And um, so I, 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 I didn't know. And I was like, well, what do y'all think? And they told me what they would pay. And it was like, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> but and it, that's, not, that's not me understanding that's in LA. It's a different cost of living, blah, 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 blah. Oh. But it's still like, you know, wow. like Macaulay Culkin emoji thing, yeah. right? And, um, and so I go back to L.A. and I tell him, you know, what's up? And he's like, um, hmm, you know what? Just being real, like, and, and, and now things that make sense to me wouldn't have made sense then. But, you know, when I think about now, DreamWorks was like all of the, the titans of Hollywood from animation. It was Steven Spielberg. It was like people from Disney, like Katzenberg. It was like, the, it was huge. David Geffen. It was just all this power and money, right? And you know, LaFace was a production company. Like, so anyway, he was like, look, I can't, I can't do that per se, but what else do you want? And I was like, oh, I need my own space to carve out. And he was like, well, I'll give you a, a subsidiary. And that's how Get Open came about. Cause he was like, you know, things that you want to do that wouldn't necessarily be, cause I was, I was being frustrated a little bit cause I felt like I can't get off my little ghetto shit. Like the shit that I liked <laughs> because LaFace is pristine. Yeah, right. You know, and I understood and respected it. So I, he gave me a space, ghetto vision. I was like, my vision, and you know, yeah. boom. So that's how that happened. And and then I ran into Tip. Just, like, did you know him beforehand, or did um, you see him? Like, I met Tip during the recording of I think our last PA album. Okay. Um, and yeah, he came through, and being him, the same person, like consistent the whole time. Um, and was said he could rap, and I was like, okay, well, rap on this. And he got in five minutes, killed the verse. Like, it's on the last PA album. Um, that album actually is funny because it's like everybody in Atlanta's on it from Akon, Bone Crusher, Jim Crow, like, which is Polo to Dunn. Like, it's so much on the album when I, I was listening to it one day and just thinking about, oh shit, that was Akon just doing that little shit. Like, like just people who were just around, and it's dope. Um, but that being said, yeah, so tips on it, and he killed it. And I was like, I had to go to LA for the Source Awards the like next week, because like Dungeon Family, we were doing Watch for the Hook at the Source Awards. Ooh, cool and, breeze, yeah. Yeah. So, so Tip came with me. I was like, you want to go with me? And it was the coolest thing because he he ended up Cool Breeze drove because he doesn't fly, um, and he wasn't there for sound check. Yeah, so he wasn't there for sound check, and Tip ended up doing his. His sound check, his his blocking, camera blocking, like where he and like where everybody does it. And at the end of it, everybody's like, Man, Shot ain't scared. And that moment was like, yeah, he ain't and he fit and he wasn't shook, but he was all respect. Right. Like, cause he knew all Cool Breeze's verse. Like Ah, uh, okay. Like so he, so he actually did the verse. Respected it. Yeah. Right. So it was just dope. But um and then so we started rocking and that was it. That's how I started. The thing about about tip T I remember is when the record, you know, back when Rap City was a thing and shit like that, you know, and, and the video came out, and I was like, well, who's this new nigga with a Beanie Man on the hook, number one, a Southern rapper, and it's not to say nothing about Southern, obviously, but you, you a Southern rapper it, with Beanie Man on the hook on some Caribbean shit, like, that's dope, uh -huh. with a Neptune's beat. To me, that was, like, unheard of, or, like, it almost seemed like, like, 
the cheat code coming, you know, coming out the gate. Like, damn, that's what a way to 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 start your your career with that type of weight on your on your first single. Yeah, it, it, but the thing is, okay, so in, in this, I think might have had something to do with why it took a second for people to trust that Ti was Ti because it seemed too good to be true. It was like it seemed like a setup, but it was natural based on what was happening at that moment. Like. I had just signed TI. I'm working on. I'm 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 successful as an A&R person at this point. Like I'm learning that. Oh shit! I got more than one project that worked right back to back. We're in the middle of doing Usher 8701. Um, Pharrell is now a, somebody I know. Right. So we just hang like we're not hanging like we were just kicking it back then. But 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 we'd be around each other enough to be cool with each other. And one of the Usher sessions, I was I talked to him about the tip. And I played him a record, and he was, it was the funniest shit in the world, but like that story. But, um, but after he listened, he was like, yo, he, yo, he can, like every bar, he, and he was like, killing it. Like, and he was like, yo, I gotta work with him. So it was like a organic. organic. It wasn't like, yo, I got a, I got a bag for you. Right. It was really like, did it. He and respected tips, style, skill. And t- yeah. And it just made sense. They met cool. Verse came out. He was like, "Yo, you know, to be dope, I want to put Beanie Man on it." <laughs> cool. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It wasn't. It was like, it sounds crazy, but in that moment, that's just what was happening. Like, er, like Atlanta was popping. We were, people were successful. Successful people want to be involved with other successful people because it's a trust there that you're like, you get it. Like, you get the levity of if this doesn't work. Yeah. It's like that's the other part people don't get. It's like it's not that people like, like. They people say shit like winners hang with winners, but it's because you want to go, you want to be around people who have the same. It's like that equally yoke thing. It's like if this goes bad, we all are gonna feel this. If it goes great, we all are gonna feel this. You know, so it, it's like-minded thought more than just that whole winner thing. But anyway, that's just who was hanging around. That was access. And at that time, Beanie Man was, he was, yes. I think he had just did the record with Maya too, that yes. like he was, crazy. Like, was I man. mean, but again, beautiful. Yeah. Crazy. What was it, what was it like being uh, behind that project and seeing an artist that you discovered and him coming out and then it, it working? Like, well, it didn't work, work first. Really? Nah, it was, I mean, well, it worked in the sense that it showed the world he was this person. But like commercially and financially, it didn't work. Work. It was like we only sold about probably about one hundred seventy thousand records of I'm serious. But it was dope to me because it happened like damn near five thousand records a week for almost like seventy weeks. Is that better? Is that better? I guess back then because it's different now. But is that better? Like the slow consistency as opposed to the quick strike and then the the drop off. I, I would say yeah, because Tip is still Ti. He's doing. He's still here. Yeah. Like you know, what I mean, it's and, and I know a lot of people who had bigger records when he came out. Mm-hmm. Right. I won't even think about it. I won't even play them in old school sets. So it's like, you know, I, I think um, if you take the longer, or, or I don't even say the longer route, just take the proper route, right? like to go through the process. Mm-hmm. It hap- It's gonna be better because you'll know things that people who skip the process don't know. So if you get in a situation, you know how to handle it different than somebody who they just put in a position. Right. Like Tip worked for a long time. So it's like his his degree of seriousness about it is different than someone who fell into it. Right. On that album, uh, my favorite song on there is Pussy Poma number one. And I, you know, I know it lyric for lyric. Bam Lay, actually, that, he, that was his hook. Family, oh, that's what he's down with uh, Pusha T and them. Uh huh. Uh, rock and roll, rock and roll, and all that. Yeah, like Damn. that was Fam's record. Like I heard that we were in when we were doing. I'm serious. For real, played with that record, and I was like, oh man, that'd be so cool if Chip had it. <laughs> and Fam was gracious enough to like, yeah, take that, take yeah. yeah cause I'm then he's because he starts off the second verse. It was me and KP and that's NYC. That's a, that's a different song. No, for real? No. Mm-hmm. Huh? Oh, absolutely. What song was that? Meet me at the hotel. Meet me. At, oh yeah, that's oh that's the one with Too Short. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's my favorite record. That's my favorite. Yeah, yeah. But Pharrell did the Pussy Puma number yeah. one one. Yeah. Yeah. Damn, yeah. that's just a hundred thousand. I mean, but that shit was loaded. Like, but it, it, the thing is, it it's still dope. Like, 
the thing is, okay, so here's the thing. It, it, like I said, with the su success thing, I'm sorry, these Invis Invisalign got me doing it, super asses. Um, but the, um, <laughs> the, the, the way that it built, it was actual fans. Like, it was people telling people. Like, it looked like 5,000 people bought it, 5,000 more bought it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily, like, building, like, 5,000, 10,000, but it was, like, 5,000, 5,000, 5,000. 5,000 for like a long time. I wish they're probably still fans because, to this day. But also what Tip did, the most artists didn't do, was wherever those records was popping up, he would go. I saw him at, at FAMU Homecoming in our, in our gymnasium. And I, I didn't know him. I saw the, the record on the, the uh, album series on TV, but that was, and it was like, yeah, we performing in a gym to then, just to see that, and then 20 years later, he's like an icon. In, in but he still works the same. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um... It's a, it's a, it's a, it just takes me, I just keep thinking back to that time and, and, and because I always thought he was dope. I thought, I knew he was like from the same vein of, of Andre and Scarface and just lyricists, like lyricists. Yeah, but it goes to that same thing that we were talking about, about DJ and starting it. Like somebody gonna look at you crazy. Like to say, like the first thing he said was, I'm the king of the South. Like, first of all, you're building a wall at that point of like line in the sand, what's up? So it's either people who respect that thought, like the, the champion in you thought. And you know, that's a lot of people though. Like most people feel like, yeah, I am. That's me too. Like we all are, like it's not intimidating. But then you got, you gonna, you gonna, you gonna draw a line between you and the pussy nigga right quick. So it eliminates a certain amount of things you got to deal with. Like, so it's like, if people just made the statements of what it is, it's like, this is what I'm on. You, you would find that people who are on that too would come right over and people who aren't, don't. And it allows for you to get straight to your shit. You know, I kind of uh, want to kind of circle back a little bit, not circle back, but because you, we're talking around the time 2001, two, three, and then we met in 2003 mm -hmm. and you were working with Sarah Devine, but then that was also the time where you signed my cousin, mm -hmm. uh, King Rain. Yes. I was raised with music as my religion. Music kept me going, there was nothing else to give them. Those who know me know that I was always on a mission. Happy with myself, but not happy with my position. A God never settles, thank God for competition. Simon and the time is the millennium edition. Never met my dad's father in this existence, I miss him. We meet in some dimension, man, dad, I got some questions. Went to so many public schools and learned so many lessons. Like people are the same and being human is a profession. I'm thinking, fuck diseases, human beings die from stressing. You can miss the point, ride or dying for perfection. In my dressing room, there's hardly any dressing. I come as I came. How did that, because that blew my mind. Like, how did that, that even come to be? Oh, um, so, I just got to Sony, I think. Um, yeah, Sarah was one of the first things I signed at Columbia. And the guy managed her. I saw her. She had a song. Oh, she had this song. He is. It was so crazy. Yes. Heather Headley ended up getting it and, and, and blew that whole thing. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. Um, but... You know, one of those, this is one again one of those things that happened, right? So, only because Smooth and Trigger were on it, on the or on the remix version of 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 oh. Sarah's, oh, and then it was like the same broken language beat. Yeah, no, no, no. it's the same song. It was, yeah, like it was. I mean, but it was another. Uh, you know, this is one of them. You know, sidebar producer issues, but yeah, they gave the song to somebody else because it was a better opportunity for them, and you know, we you know. We had a plan based on that song. I felt, yeah. And, it, and, and, and you know, things just went left on that. But I, I had met Rain in Canada, I think. I went up for, like, some kind of conference. Mm -hmm. And God knew him, obviously, through you guys. And he was just a brilliant artist. He could, he, he could rhyme, for real. And I just, I'm, I have an affinity for writers. I think writers are amazing. Yeah. And he was an amazing writer. So I was just like, let's see what you can do. I remember um, going in a session with him and uh, Farrell Monch when they when they did that, that that record together, and it was like I mean it was just a special time for our family, as, you know, especially like our generation, like me, my cousin Simeon, because it's like oh shit, it's like one of us got through, like like we we on, and then uh, but that's around the time where, where like Sony was dissolving or something happened in, in within the company, like the yeah, you know, it was like a management change, yeah. yeah. Because I know, uh, I think A. Marie was on the label at the same time as Sarah and, and Beyonce, obviously. 
Yeah, I mean, Beyonce was always there. Was that always there? Don't, don't get it fucked up. Huh? Beyonce is always there. She's always been there. Yeah. <laughs> is it? Is there like reasons why you feel like, especially with with Sarah and 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 Rain, why they didn't work? That's like beyond anything creative. Man, like it's so amazingly difficult to try to figure that out because it's all it's, it's it's like everything counts like it could be the day that they missed the bus to get to the studio to get the beat that would have been the song that you know what I'm saying? it's like who the fuck knows but it's it's just it's you know I, I, what i know for sure is the most focused people tend to get the farthest faster and as creative as we can be sometimes you can create obstacles as well for yourself if you don't you know, yeah, it's like it's about the focus. It's about what it is you're trying to do. And, and if you want to surround yourself with people who are going to push your agenda, that's solely your agenda, that might not necessarily make all the sense. Or you're going to get with people, you know, like all the successful people, you look at their teams, right? They tend to be really smart and really efficient. <laughs> the people who aren't, you look at their teams and you go, I can see where that could have messed that up. Like, it's like, it, it's hard. This is not an easy thing. But it's like the more focused and the more clear you are and the more willing you're, and this is the part, the more you're willing to sacrifice for the goal, the quicker it can happen. But not in the Illuminati way, but like in the, like, not bullshitting around at the club when you don't have to be, when you can be practicing. Right, right. Yeah. Um. The 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 Source Awards '95 when Dre said South got something to say. Were, were you there? Yeah. You were, was that a? Did you know he was gonna say that before he said it? Like was that like? Nobody knew they were gonna boo. Like, did they? Because I've seen like obviously I, I, I wasn't there. Obviously Selwyn was there, but like y'all really they really booed them for for winning. Yeah, it's just on tape. Like you can go to you can go to YouTube for that one. So what's up, Dre? Pressure can either bust pipes or create a diamond, and what Andre said when he got on that microphone created a diamond. But it's like this though, I'm tired of folks, you know what I'm saying? The closed-minded folks, you know what I'm saying? It's like we got a demo tape and don't nobody want to hear it, but it's like this, the South got something to say, that's all I got to say. <laughs> but but it was also I want to say Mob Deep was in that category. Mm -hmm. well, what was the you remember the um was it album of the year or, or best best new, best new artist? Best best new, do, I, I don't even that's the crazy part. I want to say it was duo group, but whatever it was, the booth started. We weren't sitting on the road with them. My group PA, we were like in the like a little middle because you know we weren't popping. Um, our <laughs> our seats were different. Um, so it was one of them like oh shit we were just getting up like oh, it looked like it's about to go down when you know the booze and shit started so we just got up like let's get ready like goody mob was closer they got to the stage fast you know it was like no it was like we all knew this felt weird but nobody know nah, dre what it is is we know dre enough to know that he felt that and he was gonna feel that different. It's like, if you watch Big Boy, like Dre, what you gotta say? It's like, it's almost like, all right, y'all. Here you go. <laughs> and yeah, it was just, yeah. That wasn't, I don't know, nobody, nobody could have planned that. Like, again, you would have had to know they were gonna boo to have that. Right? Yeah, yeah. Was there, was there already a feeling of, of nope. the South? Well, in, just in, in the music industry itself, of the South we not feeling happy. respected? Yeah, of course, but we were happy to be there. We thought, like, this was the proof. Like, we're in it. Yeah. See? Yeah. Like, it wasn't, like, y'all hear this shit. Like, it's jamming. Right. Um, you respect, like, the lyricism, you got to give us credit for that. Yeah. The production's different. We're not on y'all dick. Right. Like, it's totally different. It's, like, yeah, you don't, y'all don't fuck with that. And it, it it was that kind of feeling of disregard more than it was like not liking it. Yeah. It's like, come on now, y'all boo though. Right, like who gets booed at a war show? No, who gets booed for this? Like not, fuck that, like y'all hear this. Like y'all can't boo that, like you cannot like it. You cannot like that it won over somebody you like more. But understand it was in the same category because it's as good. Yeah. Uh, exactly. The possibility right. of it winning is there. Right. 
That's crazy, man. And then Outkast, one of the most celebrated groups in hip hop history. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. yeah tackling fuel. <laughs> like, tackling fuel. Like, you ever watch, um, was it um, Waterboy? Like, you know, you take the, the, that shit and make it tackling for you. I mean, get out there and, you know, everybody's the, the, the devil. <laughs> so you go, you do all this, you go through the a and game, the creation, the 8701, everything. And then somewhere you completely stop DJing. You're focused on executive role. What's your biggest accolade you think you've received from that side of the business? Because I have one in my mind, but I want to see if it's the same same thing that you think. The biggest accolade? Yeah. What's the biggest thing you've done? On executive To you. Side. On the executive side? Yeah. Uh, I'm A and R side. Yeah, on, a, on the non-DJ side. <laughs> yeah. Um, you like, do you like um, Entourage? The show? Omari. Oh, Omari, yeah. I love that song. You love an Omari song. <laughs> That's that's you. Like I mean, it's like it. it you know, you, that was a great record though. That's, I still play that shit. Me too. But I'm, but I'm saying it in a in a successfully getting him out of something. You probably like. Did you, how many B2K records you love? One. <laughs> bump bump bump. You can't even talk about it. Um, you can edit that. No, but, I, I like, no, no, I no, like no, 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 no. Just playing. Yeah, but no, I, feel, I see. I see. But what I'm saying is, you ain't supposed to like that. But it's like being able to get and see the dope thing about him. Like, cause there's, you know, obviously for anybody to be successful, it's something in there, right? So it's like to get it to, for you to just see it. Like, I feel like we all did a great job, obviously with him as well, but that project of growing him up, like that was, that was a cool thing to me. Yeah, that's, I definitely wasn't expecting that. That, okay. that That's dope. To me, it would be uh, you getting the Grammy for uh, Kendrick Lamar. Oh, all right. That's tight. <laughs> That's tight too. Like, shit, okay. What was uh, what was like being involved in that record like? Um, serendipity. Like, um, happened to be in a room at a moment where there was a a, a gap, and a, had a thought that filled the gap, and it counted. Yeah, and it got to Kendrick Lamar because it wasn't supposed to be for him. Um, so it's like the fact that like two, three years later, after, after that hook or that piece was done, it, and like, it didn't get on any other record. It didn't come out. Kendrick got heard it and, and was triggered to do what he did with it. And it's like for, for what that record means, aside from anything, you know, that my contribution or whatever, right? It's what it does for people and when people, when I see people hear it and listen to it, it's like, that's, yeah, pff, that's crazy. Every now and then there, there, and you know, this is from DJ to DJ, this is, there are certain records that I play that they give me goosebumps. And like, that's one of them. Like, you know, I'm sure you have certain records too when you play it, if you feel a way about it, like, cause there are a lot of records that I'll play, you play that the crowd might react to, but you don't give a fuck, it's like, yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah. But then there are other ones that like, and that's one of them. Uh, I think um, "Father Stretch My Hands" part one is another oh, one of those. Good. You know, like yeah, when you play it at the like, right at, at, at the, the right, right time, moment, yeah. it's yeah, it's, amazing. When I play those records back to back, oh, it's over. That's great. Like, it's, I it's, might do that one day. It works. <laughs> it works. Um, but yeah, no, it, it definitely works. But uh, how you how do you get back into DJing because you're currently spinning like within the last recent years last couple of years of your life right mm -hmm. what pushed you to get back into it after having such a successful a and r executive music business career um i think oh so at this time at sony new management they come in clean house i get fired but i get you get fired yeah i got fired like yeah john legend was out it was like it was a good i was being successful but it was like legit. It's like you did John Legend. Yeah. Oh shit. Yeah. Signed John Legend. I produced Greenlight actually. Um, Just uh, blew my mind. Yeah, with Malay, my homeboy Malay, one time. Damn. Um, and Andre's on that. Yeah. 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 Um. So yeah. So okay. So so I get fired from Sony. 
the night, the day, matter of fact, the day I get fired from Sony, I was supposed to go meet with Malay that night. And I, I said, I hit him, I was like, yo, I, I don't work here no more, you still wanna meet? He was like, hell yeah. So we go talk, and I tell him, look, well, I'm about to go move back to Atlanta, blah, 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 you know, I'm buying a, the crib, and just, you know, because it wasn't like a, a painful firing, it was one where it was like, okay. And, and so I just went, bought, I like bought a house and put a studio in it, and Malay was like, look, I'll come, move down, we can just produce together. And, and I hadn't produced since PA. So it was just me and him had conversations about how, because he's really dope. He can play everything. He can do a bunch of stuff. Um, and we had a conversation about if that was moved here. How about if this was here? He was like, "Man, shit! Like, why don't I come down and we just see what happens?" First thing that happens is I get after I get fired. John Legend asked me to come back and do his project, and he plays me this record he wrote with someone else. Um, I took the acapella back to Atlanta, and me and Malay produced around his vocal. And then I, I got, then I asked Dre, did, did he like it? He got liked it, he did it. Oh. So I went hard like Medusa looking at me, yeah. Yes, One, the, I think every, everything Dre, I've never heard a whack Dre verse ever in, in 25 years. Um, so okay. you get fired, you <laughs> produce Greenlight, but then there's oh. still something that says, let me go start DJing again? Um, because then, like, I think, one, it was like some holiday. I think it, this always happens to me around the holidays. But so, because Greenlight happened, it it got done on New Year's Eve. But um, the I was home for the holidays. My homeboy was at the house, and I was practicing, just playing around, not practicing like for anything in particular, but just messing around. And he was like, "Yo, who you think you is? Q from Juice?" And and I was like, "No, I'm just trying to get my shit back." And he was like, "Man, you know, actually, you tighter than most of these dudes out here doing it." You could probably, he was like, you could, you could go out here and work if you wanted to. I was like, mm. And he posted it. And when he posted it, somebody saw it, Troy saw it, and was like, yo, why don't you come down and do this party? And I'm like, I'm not ready. He was like, okay, I'll give you three months, come do this part, my birthday, in March. And I just practiced for like three months, like for real, like, like OCD, like, every, like, like practice, practice. Um, went down, he had booked me two parties, First one, the shit was trash. I, I was trash, like because I I had been practicing on turntables. Uh, uh-huh. and they had CDJs. CDJs. So. Uh. so anyway, so I was I was trash a little bit. Like it was trash. I know it was trash, but I got I by. No, but you know. I know for a fact it was trash. I don't know how much they know if it was like <laughs> facts for them, but it was like whatever. So, but I can tell it wasn't great. It was not great. Um, but so the next night I was like, nah, man, give me turntables. Like, and the club was mad, everybody was mad, like, turntable, uh. yeah, and I'm like, just, come on, man, just help me out, help me out here, because I'm just, it's a, it's a comfort level, yeah. Yeah. and I was like, I'm not going to be playing old shit, just let me have turntables, <laughs> like, <laughs> so, so, that night rocked, and I was like, ah, oh. like, and it got me so cold, because I was like, I started, I just, because I had turntables, it wasn't about young, old, it was, it was just, caught a vibe and a vibe of everybody in the room and I feel like I saw everybody have a oh moment and I was like that's all I want to do I want to I like that shit yeah. and then I was like let me just you know yeah let me focus more Is it, it's a different feeling now DJing in parties for crowds as opposed to being a tour DJ even I mean skill wise it's the same thing essentially no, but I don't think so no no because you can have a set on tour like on tour you're in a different city every night you can play the exact you can play the exact same set. I never, I don't, because I, they're just things about city. Like again, it's like I engage, I like engaging, but but you can. It's a lot easier to have a set than it is to come in a party dry. You walk in, the DJ done already hit all the hottest records. When you walk in and they see you, they drop ten back to back hooks yeah, of just yeah. all the top ten records and be like, all right my guy, your yeah, turn. Yep, yeah, exactly. So yeah, at that point, <laughs> you you then have to figure out, all right, so what can I do that I know he ain't done right. that that still works for them? Because sometimes you go in these spots, it's the DJ, he's the DJ there every week. Right. Or, or just, you know, he has he knows the records. Yeah. So you gotta it, it, you gotta you gotta be nimble. And, and I think that's the part that's exciting. I enjoy that part because it's like, okay, well, shit. Okay, cool. And, and, if, and when, when you find it, it's like, yeah, it's dope. It's just like, you, you, you know, you got everybody locked and everybody on a cord. Mm-hmm. 
and you know when you can drop in the entire club is singing singing along. yeah it's like good it's hard to describe that feeling to somebody who who's not a dj that you know that type of that call and response that it it's hard to describe what that feels like when it works yeah. but it's amazing yeah. i love that shit. i was djing with marley marl the other night some legendary oh, shit. and uh uh <laughs> okay, you dropped something okay. <laughs> 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 not that he was playing he, he wasn't playing like hit records because it wasn't that type of room but he was playing like a breakbeat set and it was he had a break dance um battle happening on the dance floor and it was working And he, it was about 30 minutes of that. And I was like, fuck, what am I gonna do when I get, cause I gotta play after him. So I'm like, damn, what am I gonna do? I mean, I gotta figure out a way to not kill the energy, but restart the party. And so the first record I played was uh, Mary J, I'm going down. And then all the girls, were, yeah. you know. You, you, yeah, you, you made it your, your, like he had a whole moment. So you gotta take this moment somewhere else, yeah. like. And it's like trying to, so it's like, damn, how do, what am I going to play that's not going to kill the energy, but I have to, I don't want to, and I don't want to. You want an energy. You need yeah, energy. some kind of energy. And energy, I guess, you know, it doesn't always have to be hype, crazy, you know, but I, thankfully it worked because I went from that to Lenny Williams, because I love you. And then I was able to, you know. You, brought, you made it love. You know, it's, it's, it's these type of things that I don't know if a lot of DJs spend the, the mental time looking at it like a science like that or, or really like focusing on on the intricacies beyond just playing records yeah i don't know that anybody like i think that everybody has their own way like like i noticed that in certain spaces like it's more like strip club djing where it's like turn the music down to talk a lot right that that's a miami style too that's a, a oh, that's so. yeah well but it's a different kind of talk and it's more like if, if 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 the if the lyric of the, the line of a song says something, then the style here would be more so to say something that goes with the word in it. Like if it's a record like she's a brick house, you know, you'll say something that goes with the word house. You know, like like meet me at the house or some you know that type of that type of thing as opposed to saying the actual okay. lyric of the song. Okay. But um, yeah, it's a call and call and response thing. No, I get it. Yeah. But but yes, yeah, it's different. Uh, but no, I don't. I don't think everybody thinks about that, and I think that I'm glad because it would it would be harder for me if everybody did. You think so? No, nah, not really. But yeah, I, but I, I think so. Like, but but no no no. What I'm saying is it's one of them things that you know shit. Like it's DJs who don't like what I do. I mean it's crowds that don't like what I do. Like, what do you think it is that they they they're not liking? It's foreign sometimes. Like if you go into a club that they're used to some a DJ slamming records back to back. And and it might on, might be on beat like but it's just the way that they go through records the day when I say slam I'm saying like hook 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 and you know like if that's what they're used to if I play a record that that is a great party record and a great song like I I tend to play that a little longer and you got to know that everybody don't want to hear all that yeah. so it's like it's sometimes there are places that doesn't they don't want to hear. The breakdown or the the um, the end of before I let go, right. which is weird. Which is, crazy. Which is weird, yeah. but I'm seeing it, and right. and I'm like, oh, okay, so yeah. that ain't for me, yeah. like you know, and, and 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 that's not to say I'm in a club playing before I let go that I would normally be playing little baby, but sometimes you can get that off, yeah. Um, yeah. but but I'm saying that to say that it's some little baby verses that I like that I want to play yeah. that I can't because they don't want to hear the verses. Like they want to get to the next turn up part, right. which is you know again. I guess, I guess there, there, there's a there's an audience for for everything. Absolutely, that's that was the point. What is your 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 high, your DJ highlight since you've gotten back into it? One Music Fest. One Music Fest. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. One Music Fest was. It, yeah, it's the big. It's it's like that bucket list thing, like a headlined a festival. Like it was forty thousand people, and. I headlined it as a DJ. I didn't have to be different than I am. I was able to include my friends. The flyer said KP and friends, right? Yeah. On the promo. Yeah, yeah. super friends, yeah. Damn. And it ended up being, 
it started out as I asked Pharrell, would he do it? He said, yeah. And I was like, okay, that's cool. And then I asked Usher, he was like, yeah. I was like, okay, cool, so we good. At the, at the end of the day, I ain't gotta say nothing else. Like, I got too, like, bonafide, right? So then, as I started doing putting a set together, I started thinking, well, I know that person too. What if they came out? Like, because I was putting together a set was, that was gonna be energy, right? Because it's Atlanta. I was like, ooh, it'd be dope if I could get these people to come and it'd be like a live mixtape or a live party. And that's what it was. It turned into like a real, it, it, was, it, was, it was fun as a party. Like Waka Flocka, Crime Mob, Young Jock, Lil Nas X, Pharrell, Usher, um, Trey Songz, uh, Rotimi, Cap G, Monica, Young Bloods, Lil John. It was a bunch of people. F L Y, the guys who do swag surf. Yeah, like it's it's like, but it was fun. And then you also did uh, what's the one in Virginia? Something in the water. Something in the water. But I did that with so that was a Pharrell and Prince set, and I'm I'm M D for his band, so like I helped put together his his show. Uh -huh. So like, yeah, I'm M D. Some something major happened on that one. Oh, Jay Z. <laughs> oh yeah, that was tight. No, 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 no. Now listen, like. That was the only, I think that might have been the only part I put on my Instagram. Like, you know, Jay-Z, my favorite rapper. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah, I think. Like, from a, me and, me and, me and Guy have this conversation, there's a Jay-Z line for every thought sometimes. From, as a grown-up, uh -huh. like, as a person who's grown up, like, he has a part, he has a line for my ignorant shit. Yeah. He has a line for my, like, highly elevated parts. <laughs> like, so, he's the only person I, like, not only, let me not say that, but he's one of the, the artists that successfully grew up. Did you know that he was coming out during like, was that like a pre-conversation? You and Fred was like, yo, so, you know, Hov's gonna come out and... Yeah, we knew it for a long time. But then when it happened, it was still, like... Yeah, it blew my mind, like, cause I was like, listen, cause I'm DJing, but I'm also like, oh man, that's Hov. I'm like, oh shit, wait a minute, hold up. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's tight. That's dope. That's yeah, dope. I think, I mean, dude, dude has that kind of music and that kind of thing that, that throws everybody off. I think, you know, I think about that and when I think about hip hop culture and I think about, you know, the aging of it, like he just turned 50 years old and, you know, 444 came out like two, three years ago. And obviously you don't do it for money. You don't, you know, but there's something in, in the culture that's, that always looked down upon the aging element of it and getting older within the culture and still con choosing to put out music and content. Um, and I think it's like we're now in a space where maybe it's becoming cool to continue to create the art and continue to help push the culture forward in a positive light, regardless of your age. Yeah, I think cooler people are getting older. That's, is that what it is? Yeah, because, yeah. Yeah, it's just like, you know, I think generationally, right, there's generations away from cool, like different elements of, gen, you know, of cool things, right? So we didn't have a generation that understood any of the shit we were talking about. Like, you know, it was a, it was a pull your pants up movement, you know what I mean? So for, to see someone grow from that to this place, it gives, um, I think it gives credence to like what we're doing and just the, the idea that, you know, kids grow up, man. It's like, you can't, you know, you can't really hold somebody liable for the rest of their life for some shit they did or said at 21. This is impossible. It's like you don't know enough. And growth is the part. But if that person is interesting enough, you'll watch them grow. You know, if they're interesting enough and smart enough to grow. So it's like, you know, shit, no. Hey, hip hop, is, it's, it's too new. To, we didn't even have a reason to say some old niggas because there were none. There were none, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, it's like... Like the first grown up hip hop artists were like what, like, you know, Grandmaster Flash and that that crew, right? So we we just wouldn't dress like that. So it's not it's it doesn't register the same as seeing Jay Z grow up. And a and a and a and a Armani suit or whatever suit. That's how I'm for. Like whatever. It's like he Yeah, it's, if you see somebody do something gracefully, it makes it different. That's dope. Okay. I thank you, family. Oh, thank this is dope. This is dropped a lot of jewels on me. I didn't even know about. That's dope. Yeah, oh, dope, man. Uh, I know you got you got a lot more DJing ahead of you. I know you're looking forward to getting back into it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think I took a break, like after one music fest. That was like I think that took a lot out of me. Yeah. But not in a bad way. Just in a like, okay, now what? Because that was like one of those bucket list things that I think was going to happen way later. 
So now I had to recalibrate and not get on no, now I only do that. So. I'm looking forward to seeing what's next. Cool, me too. Cool. All right. Yeah. Like my bitches real thick, no mo ties. Richer than your old head, nigga, no lie.